Welcome. This is uh, resources for uh, educational technicians across the state of Maine who are interested in learning about social emotional um, education, multi tiered systems of support. And um, I am your host, I'm Kelly Bailey. I am the um, SEL specialist. We have Andrea Logan and Laura Jones. Andrea Logan is our MTSS specialist for the state of Maine, and Laura Jones, who is our guest and um, educational technician three extraordinaire. So she's going to help us with that, uh, with these two competencies. What I wanted to start with today is really just to talk to you about our amazing brain. And it's really important for um, educational technicians as well as um, our, our teachers and our specialists in our schools to really have a solid understanding of just the basic brain science. So what you're looking at right here is really um, just a, a little mock-up that I had my daughter, um, Hannah Bailey, who's an art teacher at Lemoyne um, Consolidated School, K through eight. We teach the amazing brain and we, we want to um, just really focus on really three sections. The thinking brain, which is called the prefrontal cortex, and this is where all your critical thinking happens. This is where you're able to tap into your executive functioning brain, your processing brain. It's the place where you can take in new information, think about it, flip it around, and do something new with it. And when kids feel safe, connected, and loved, and regulated, then their thinking brain, or prefrontal cortex, is what we call online and able to assist that person, you, me, and children, humans, in doing our best learning in that moment. Anytime emotion or um, an upset in the system happens, then the thinking brain kind of shuts down and all the neurochemistry that supports that, like dopamine and serotonin and the endorphins, like, um, and endorphins, they just kind of become uh, inactive. And then this little piece right here, which is called the amygdala, and it's teeny, teeny, tiny little almond-shaped um, part that sits behind the prefrontal cortex, that's what takes over. That's your survival brain. That's your protecting brain. The neurochemistry that gets uh, flooded to that space from uh, other pieces of your brain and from your spinal cord is things like cortisol and norepinephrine and adrenaline. And while it's really okay for us to have those types of um, neurochemistry thrumming through our body during times of excitement, or you know, if we're excited about seeing somebody we love, or we're getting up to bat, or we're going someplace new, or you know, it's our birthday, you know, those kinds of things, you're going to have those excitable moments, and um, it's okay for that. But we, what we're talking about is that toxic level, right? If your brain is flooded with toxic neurochemistry that doesn't support your learning, then the thinking brain becomes inactive, basically, and the protecting brain uh, takes over. And so when you think about emotions, we call this, you know, the back brain, the emotion brain. And, you know, every, this is a very just, you know, gross anatomy of this. This is not meant if you are a bio person, this is not, you know, true to scale or anything like that. But we call this the ocean of emotions, right? So if you have an emotion that is happy and joyful and safe and, and feeling, you know, um, gratitude, then your neurochemistry is going to support that engagement of your thinking brain. But if you're feeling a little afraid or a little overwhelmed or a little upset or a little frustrated, then that part of the brain that takes care of new learning slows down and the protecting brain becomes in charge because there, it thinks you know, that there's danger and this is their survival brain. So what's really important for us to recognize and know is that tricky learners, kids who are you're in charge of, they're going to be, right? They're going to be probably more geared towards that tricky learner survival brain, especially if they have had a history of trauma. Okay, so if trauma is something that's in their life and has been in their life, it's even if it's past, even if in utero, they're going to be hardwired for protection. And that's something for you to really, really think about. And not only for your students, but also for yourself. And Laura's going to talk about later what happens when we get triggered, when, um, when kids trigger us and when kids, you know, um, big or small, when they when they um, say or do something that causes us to react rather than respond. And then we get into this power thing. So when the amygdala is in charge, the only 
things that the amygdala, that the body can do is fight with the words of your body, you know, so fighting physically or with, with language. Flight, which is really running away. I need to see the nurse or it's that slinking underneath the table. Um, freeze, which is, you know, that you, you see them, those kids that want to walk around with their hoods over their heads all of the time, right? They just want to hide. They want, they want to be frozen or submit. And so those are the things that their survival, survival brain does. And so what is really important for us is to make, to make sure that we're paying attention to whatever emotional state our students are in in any given period of time. So if you see your students who are bored or enthusiastic, happy or sad, angry, you know, sulking, whatever it is, confused, overwhelmed, instead of seeing those emotions as a barrier, see the emotions as a, oh, this is awesome. Jimmy is showing me anger. He's showing me that he's feeling angry. And so rather than try to challenge Jimmy into uh, not being angry anymore, right? We honor that he's angry. We say, hey, I see you're feeling really angry. I get that. I have felt angry a lot, Some, you know, too. There are lots of things that make me feel angry. I'm wondering, how would you rather feel? So always giving agency or always giving choice. That's one of the really important things. So I always use this phrase, but emotion, it's really important for you to know. Emotion will drive a student's attention. It will drive a human's attention. And attention will always drive or steer our learning. So that's the thing that you know, we want, we want these kiddos to pay attention on purpose. We want them to be able to listen and learn. And, you know, you know, you hear all the time from their teachers, right? From their, from their primary teachers. Oh my gosh, if you could just sit still, if you could just listen, if you could, you know, can you take him out and do this math or, you know, or, you know, you're going to be the person that's taking care of these kiddos when they're suspended or, you know, in the, in the ISS room, you know, watch and see what the emotion is. And instead of being confused or maybe worried or afraid of the emotion, see it as a gift and that it's telling you something because every behavior that a human shows or a human being presents is, is a gift for us to learn by. So, uh, so what causes emotions? Um, if you take a look at this slide, you'll see that something happens right? Something in that purple or that orange circle, rather, something happens. And that thing that happens makes you think something, right? It makes you think something. So you think that you um, are going to be good at that, or you think that that's something that's going to be horrible for you, or you think that that's something that you like or something that you are going to enjoy. And it's that thought process that actually drives your emotion. If I want you to write down, for those of you that are taking notes, T bar. So T as in Tom, F as in Frank, A as in Adam, and R as in Riley. T far. And T far stands for thoughts cause feelings, feelings lead to actions, and actions get you a result. So T far. And that is the cognitive process that our brains go through every I'm hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a day. Anytime you have an emotion or you feel something, it started by a thought, whether you are acknowledging that thought or not. And so if you something happens to you, you have a thought about it, the thought drives your feeling about it. Now from here, you have a couple of choices, right? Because it's that feeling that's going to drive your action to whatever it is that you ultimately decide to do next. And so when you think about that, if you can identify an emotion as it's happening, you have a choice to make. If it's an emotion that's going to make you blow your top or act out or come or do something that you wouldn't otherwise normally do or say and you can go back to thinking about what you're going to do or how you're going to react you're more likely to make a better decision if you can go back to your thinking brain before reacting from your feeling brain so t far thoughts cause feelings feelings lead to actions and actions lead to results 
if you can go back to your thinking brain and think about something from a different perspective, you can change your feelings and changing your feelings can then lead to better actions and your actions are going to lead to better outcomes. And so that's where our emotions come from. It's the things that happen to us and what we think about them um, that drives our emotional peace to any situation or any action. Right, and it's really important to know that your emotions are going to ebb and flow given uh, the environments that you're in or the, uh, where the, the environment that you've come from or the environment that you're going to. So thinking about those students who may have something coming up where they're just not sure what's going to happen next or, you know, they feel solid and fine in their homeroom, but they need to go to first period. And that's maybe um, a class where they have felt some shame or they have, you know, they're worried because they don't feel that they uh, do as well in that class. Or maybe it's just where am I going after school today? So if a, if a student, if a human being is not sure, if, if we are faced with levels of uncertainty and those levels of uncertainty get heightened by our fear that we attach to the uncertainty, then that's what's going to be leading us through our day. And so it's really important for us also not to, to think that we can rationalize or cognitively manage people um, in and out of emotional places if they are in back brain protection. So that's why we're going to really talk to you today about the, level, the, the competencies of self-awareness and self-management. Because something happens, we think it, what do we do, how do we feel? In order to go through that cycle that Andrea is showing you, you have to have a level of self-awareness. If you aren't aware that, oh, I'm thinking something, and it's either something that's happened before, or I'm concerned that it's going to happen, it, that it is going to happen, so I'm foreboding or forecasting, which a lot of our anxious learners or gen uh, students who have generalized anxiety, they're always in that heightened place. It's just a low hum, right? There's a low frequency that's always there that says I'm not okay and even if we say cognitively and communicate you're okay let's get this done you're okay they won't believe you because they know that their limbic system tells them they're not okay so we can't try to justify them out or coerce them out or even love them out of their feelings we have to help them change the neurochemistry of their brain and that's why this is so important for you all to do your own work and your own self-awareness and your own self-management. We don't just have responsive learners and reactive learners in our classroom because I would kind of say that I'm a pretty responsive person right now, but in my past, I was kind of reactive. You know, thinking about yourself and situations and how you were, who, you know, what your support was when you were a kiddo, that's going to shape the human being that you become. And if we stay stuck in this place of automaticity and we don't notice, oh, hey, I'm feeling a little anxious right now. Like for just, in, for instance, Andrea and I were trying to get on here. She lost the link. She was not able to find the link. She had the registration, but she didn't find, you know, she couldn't find the link. And, she, and I would be willing, I think it's okay for me to share that Andrea was feeling anxiety about that because we knew people were knocking at the door. We knew I was already on the Zoom. Andrea was trying to get onto the Zoom. She's managing all this stuff behind and she has children in the home. People are calling her to say, I can't get on, I can't get on. And she's one of the co-hosts and she's trying to get on. And so she was flipping her lid a tiny little bit. She wasn't completely losing her cool, but she was saying, I can't find it. And so I was on the other end and I had two, I had, I had two choices. I could get really frustrated with her and say to her, I can't believe this. We're two seconds to get on. You, you, you can't find the link. What do you mean you can't find the link, right? All that would have done was amped up her anxiety. I would have, I would have been shaming her. I, you know, or I say, I got you girl. It's okay. I know where it is. Let's figure this out. Let's make a plan. Andrea, what was your response to me when I said that? I actually took a deep breath. I, I felt myself take a deep breath and I actually thanked you. I said, oh my gosh, thank you so much because I, I really needed you to acknowledge this stress level. Um, and, and you were like, yeah, I got you. I got you. And I, it just gave me even just a split second to just go. <sighs> right. Okay. Right. So those are our choices and as I will, human beings. Yeah. Actually, what I was going to say too is one thing that you brought up a few minutes ago, Kelly, was that um, 
you may, you gave an example that, you know, if a student might be thinking about something that's going to be happening at the end of school, right? So our thought can be large, right? And if we don't, if we're not able to somehow work through those thoughts, whatever feelings those thoughts are causing can, can really disrupt the rest of that day, especially if the thought that they're having is stronger than the thoughts that we want them to be having or the thoughts that we want that, that, that as ed techs we want them to be having or as their teachers that we want them to be having. Right. Uh, and just to kind of use myself as that guinea pig is this morning I also facilitated an entire DOE activity for a hundred and something people. I have never done that before. And I woke up nervous. And so even though I'm done and I've been through that and it's over, that nervousness has stuck with me all day long. And, and it's going to take a while to work through that. And I think that that's the same for not only us when we're working with kids, especially kids that particularly set us on edge or, or we've constantly had struggles with or somebody that our heart just always breaks for, but also our students as well. Yeah. So thinking about kids, you know, think about ourselves, you know, think about yourself when you were back in, in preschool or, you know, elementary school or middle school or high school. Were you a responsive learner? Did you feel connected and regulated? Responsive learners are just when you're in that learning moment, you feel connected and regulated. Regulated means that your, your spine is engaged, your uh, prefrontal cortex is online, you're able to connect and hear and listen and see and do things to the best of your ability. It doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do everything perfectly and right. It just means that you're going to be able to sustain that attention and focus. Kids who feel safe, connected, and loved and who are met with compassion and understanding are going to be able to be more responsive. Even those kids who are primarily maybe a dysregulated human being. So then then you also have, and you know who those kids are, you have reactive learners who are disconnected and dysregulated. These, these kiddos may have had a history of trauma which impacts their learning in very big ways. So it's, we know that it's super tricky to engage those kiddos because they are in that protective or survival system mode. So I have a um, very short video to show you, but before we do that, I wanted to just give Laura an opportunity is there anything that you wanted to say about the reactive versus responsive learner before we show this video? An interesting thought that went through my mind when Andrea was saying she's still feeling that anxiety. I think science shows that once you have that spike in cortisol and norepinephrine and all those stress hormones, it can take up to 48 hours for that to clear out of your system. So That's really kids, important. It is important. It's important to be aware that just because a child has a really rough morning on Tuesday and we're expecting them to be completely back to baseline on Wednesday afternoon. That's not always the case. But, um, yeah, so and, what was your question And it can again? shape everything that happens to you. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, right. No, I think that was perfect. I think that's exactly what we needed to have you add right okay. there. Okay. okay. So I'm gonna show this quick, quick video. I've shown this to um, children as young as kindergarten and as old as 10th or 11th grade. Um, when I show this to older children, I preface this by saying, listen, I know this is kind of cartoony, but I want you to think about the words that they're, this, this author and you know, this illustrator, what they're saying, this contributor, and I want you to ask yourself this question. Would this have been a useful thing for you to know when you were younger? Kids want to know. Imagine that you really want to play soccer at lunchtime, but when the bell rings, you can't find your shoes. When you finally get out to the field, the teams have been picked and it's too late for you to play. Maybe you got so mad that this small problem became a big problem in an instant. When we lose control of our emotions like this, we can call it flipping your lid, kind of like the way a pot might do if it was too full and too hot. A little while later, after you've cooled down, you might even feel sad when you realize that when you had a big reaction to a little problem, you could have hurt someone's feelings. What if I told you that this happens to everyone? Your parents, friends, teachers, and everyone else you know can flip their lid and lose control of their emotions sometimes. We all need to work on managing our feelings. Have you ever wondered why we can have such a hard time keeping our emotions under control? It can be really tough being a kid these days. There's just so much going on every day, at home, at school, even after school. 
Sometimes it's hard to keep a lid on things, and we act in ways that are not kind or caring, even though we don't mean to be hurtful. There are so many situations that we encounter every day that can cause our emotions to bubble up. Maybe you felt upset or frustrated when you were working on a problem or activity at school and just can't seem to get it right. Maybe something unexpected or embarrassing happened to you in front of your friends. Maybe you had something important to say but didn't get a chance to say it. These and many, many more situations can cause both kids and adults to flip their lids. So why does this even happen? Well, it has to do with the way our amazing human brains work to help keep us safe. This is your brain, the part of your body that controls everything you do. Let's take a closer look at the parts of the brain and how they can work together to help us keep a lid on things. The brain is a pretty complicated organ, so we're going to use our hand to help us visualize what's happening up there. Let's imagine that our brain has an upstairs and a downstairs. Here, where our thumb is, is called the midbrain. This is where our emotions and memories are created and stored. Below that is your brainstem. The brainstem controls the things our bodies do that we don't have to think about, like breathing. It also controls our automatic reactions to certain situations. For example, if you touch a cup with hot tea in it and it's too hot, your downstairs brain feels the pain and will pull your hand away to stop you from getting burnt. It's an automatic reaction. You don't have to stop and think about what to do. Or imagine you're out on a hike and a bear wanders onto the path. Your brain doesn't stop and think, what kind of bear is it? Is it friendly? Your downstairs brain notices that you feel scared. It takes charge and in a split second decides whether or not you should fight, fly, another word for run away, or freeze. Because of the way our downstairs brain reacts to these situations, we can think of it as our emotional brain because it reacts instantly without needing to think things through. It's always ready to take charge in any situation to help keep you safe. So if this is our downstairs brain, then this part where the back of our hand and fingers are can be seen as our upstairs brain. It's called the cerebral cortex. This part of our brain helps us think logically, act with kindness, and think about how others might be feeling. It's also the problem-solving part of our brain. It helps us to think of possible solutions to a problem and decide which one is best. The upstairs brain is our thinking brain. Your upstairs and downstairs brain don't work alone. Your brain is set up so that the upstairs and downstairs brain can communicate with itself. It sends messages from section to section all the time about what our bodies feel and need. Let's take a closer look at our brain fist. Where our fingertips are is the logic and reasoning part of the brain that springs into action when we have a problem to solve, and usually it does a great job of doing it. But sometimes it can have a hard time solving a problem if the emotional brain and thinking brain can't communicate well enough. This can happen if your emotions get too overwhelming and your downstairs brain decides that this situation might be dangerous, even if it isn't really. And we all know what happens when our downstairs brain thinks you're in danger. It triggers our fight, flight, or freeze reflex. Our emotions start to bubble up and then suddenly everything boils over. We flip our lids. This can look like a scary, angry reaction, or it might be crying or running away from a problem. Now that we've flipped our lids, see how far away our fingertips are from the midbrain? When our lids are flipped, our upstairs and downstairs brain can't talk to each other. Our emotions have become too strong and we can't think clearly and can't solve the problem in a peaceful way. So what can we do to stop us from flipping our lid? Well, it all starts with realizing that we're about to flip our lid and then turning down the heat so it doesn't happen. Remember that soccer game we talked about at the beginning of the video and you were really upset and didn't get to play? Maybe you felt your tummy rumble or you felt your face getting hot? Did your heart start to pound and did you feel your hands start to clench? Were you frustrated, disappointed, and angry? These types of strong feelings are all indicators that you might be close to flipping your lid. If you feel this start to happen, it's a good idea to walk away, take some deep breaths, and look for an adult to talk to before you flip your lid. It might be a parent, grandparent, coach, teacher, or another trusted adult nearby. They can help you with strategies to solve the problem once you've calmed down enough for your upstairs brain to be ready to do some peaceful problem solving. If you do flip your lid, those same trusted adults can offer you some time and space to cool down before you start to problem solve together. Once your upstairs brain is back in charge, you can share your story and get some help.
help. Using I statements can help you to tell an adult what you need. I need a hug. I need you to listen to what I have to say. I need another chance. I need some alone time. I need a walk. I need you to see that I can do well. Learning more about the brain and how it works can really help us to understand our emotions and to be peaceful problem solvers. When we listen to our bodies and our brains, we can turn the challenges of being a kid into opportunities to learn and grow. Thanks for watching! If you're interested in learning more about the brain and how to manage emotions, some resources are linked in the description box below. Now we kind of have an idea of what's happening in the brain when human beings experience trauma. Really basically we're talking about toxic levels of stress. And like Laura just said, when the stress hormones take over, they don't just dissipate just because we tell people to take a breath or we encourage them to take a breath. But what we do know about the brain more so now than we ever did. 10 years ago, neurobrain science started really taking over and we really started knowing. I, I have a, a long history of working in hospitals too. And you know, when stroke patients would have, you know, would have um, some type of infarct to the brain, we would think, well, we're gonna try this, we're gonna do the best we can. And after 90 days, you know, if we don't have any you know, good outcomes, they're not gonna be able to have rehab anymore. And you know, we know with traumatic brain uh, reintegration, that that's just not true anymore, that the brain is incredibly neuroplastic. And when you can have, there's, it's called the power of one, when you can just have one powerful positive connection with a child, or a child can have one positive connection with, a, with an adult who's safe and connected and, and coming from that place of love and not urgency to get learning standards met, then you're gonna start seeing how the neuroplasticity of the brain can can uh, improve. So this is um, this is um, the deepest well author, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, and she did an awful lot of work um, about adverse childhood experiences and you know just how we need to have that buffer. We need to have that really healthy, safe buffer. She says once we have the information, we're able to look at the context of our lives differently. Um, people who have come from a background of adverse childhood experiences no longer have to feel that they're to blame or that they're stupid or that there's something wrong with that, with them, and that they understand that their bodies have experienced a normal reaction to abnormal circumstances across their lifespan. This is something super, super important because these kiddos, anybody, and especially, you know, with, with the number of people we have, 200 plus people, almost 300 people, the likelihood that there are several of us sitting in this audience who have experienced adverse childhood you know, events is very high. And so this is also why some of the behaviors and some of the uh, things that children say and do big and small can trigger us because it, uh, we keep this in our motor memory. We keep this in our limbic system. It lives with us. And that's why we really need to be uh, truly understanding of our own self-awareness. This is how ACEs impact human beings over a lifespan. If a child, a human being, is, um, you know, has an adverse childhood experience, they are more prone to addictions. You know, they do have PTSD. They do have um, decreased autoimmune uh, systems. They are more uh, prone to injury. Uh, suffer from being able to make healthy relationships. Uh, our older students, you know, boys and girls will be drawn to um, maybe unhealthy lifestyles and unhealthy relationships, increased in teen pregnancy, self-harming behavior, suicide, violence. You know, all of these things are so prevalent in our, in our older, you know, in our middle school and high school population. And that's why the commissioner has also uh, formed a safety team uh, in our Office of Student Support and Safety. So we really have to ask the question like Dr. Cassie Yackley uh, from New Hampshire has said, instead of saying, what is wrong with you? We form this thought, what has happened to you, right? What has happened to you that has caused you to be so withdrawn? Who, uh, what has happened to you that has, has um, impacted your ability to trust you know, we take things very personally when children are pushed against us or push away from us. It's not personal. Um, I'm going to invite Laura to hop on. She has a, a reference, a beautiful book um, that she has read and it's helped you tremendously, not only as a parent, a grandparent, but also as an educator. Would you talk to us about that book, Laura? Sure. 
Um, actually, I have it sitting right here. I don't know. Can people see that? Is it going to be backwards? Anyway, the title of it is From Fear to Love. It's written by a man named B. Ryan Post, B-R-Y-A-N Post. Um, and he wrote it initially. The subtitle is Parenting Difficult Adopted Children. Um, I, this book was recommended to me by a play therapist that I was working with our uh, long story. Anyway, um, well, the, the long story is our granddaughter's mom. So our daughter was murdered in an act of domestic violence. So talk about trauma. There was trauma for our granddaughter prior to that. So this book was recommended to me um, as a way of understanding how her brain and her development was impacted by trauma in her early childhood. And it's, uh, it's, you feel like you're sitting across the table from this man who is explaining the difference in neurochemistry, the fact that children that have experienced trauma like that probably have cortisol coursing through their body continuously. Um, in any case, he um, is talking about these challenging behaviors and the fact that when all of the, the um, stress hormones are so present and children are on constant alert and you know, constantly looking for the danger in their lives because of their past. What makes a difference is to behave in a way to form a trusting relationship with children so that the oxytocin is re being released that counters the, um, the cortisol, the norepinephrine, the adrenaline. Because, and oxytocin is known as the love hormone, and it's only released in a safe, secure, loving relationship. So when I am working with children, I need to constantly remind myself, I need to ask myself a question in that moment of pause between um, stimulus and response. I need to be self-aware enough to ask myself, in, in my interaction and responding to this, this child that's having such a difficult time, is my behavior and are my words helping to release oxytocin in this child or am I just contributing to more cortisol? And I, I just think that if we continually recognize the power of that pause between stimulus and response, take the time to self-assess and um, ask ourselves, am I being triggered? by this kid's behavior, it, it, we can't continue to just react to behavior. We need to respond to a child's need. And in doing that, we need to build those safe, trusting relationships, and we need to help them start releasing that oxytocin in their system to calm the cortisol and calm the, the other stress hormones. So I think the point is that, and thank you for sharing your personal story too. And you know, our, that's hard to do. And you and I have known each other for quite a while now. And for you to be able to, you know, just talk about that um, and be, and and for you to know that this is real, it's profound, and children can't help what has happened to them. Right. They are really. They are just, you know, and just because that child is now 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20 does not dismiss the fact that when they were birthed one, two, three, four, five, all the way up, that they were not able to be in that safe connected and that their neurochemistry was hardwired for fear. Even, so in, even in utero. I mean, I think in children utero. are that's experiencing right. in, in utero. And we know very little, right? We know very, very little about, you know, children's birth histories. And we really don't know. I mean, um, we're not able to really know. I don't know why. I just want to go back to the Dr. Dan Siegel hand brain model. If you teach your children, you know, you open up the hand, put your thumb underneath, you close your fingers down over it. This right here represents your prefrontal cortex. That's your critical thinking brain. And when you're feeling safe, connected, loved, and regulated, this part of your brain has the neurochemistry that will support optimal learning. And that is dopamine. And that is, um, you know, there's a little bit of cortisol because we want that, you know, we want it, we don't want to be a slug, we want to be able to be engaged in our learning. So we want to be a little bit, you know, have some alertness about us. But we're talking about serotonin and the endorphins that support this just right learning. If you're using zones of regulation, this would be the green zone, right? But if you feel a little overwhelmed, a little upset, or a lot, what happens again is you go offline, the prefrontal cortex, the neurochemistry that supports that 
that, you know, those, the neural receptors for this part to engage becomes inactive or like that video said, offline. And then the amygdala becomes in charge. And cortisol is the, the only thing cortisol and adrenaline and norepinephrine can do is make you go into fight, flight, freeze, or submit. So this actually comes from your central nervous system. And the central nervous system has two parts, the parasympathetic nervous system, which really is your fight, flight, freeze, and your sympathetic nervous system, which is your calm and cool. So if you're in the parasympathetic nervous system, that's where all of that neurochemistry is gonna come from. And it's really important for you to understand that it impacts your mind, your body, and the, emotion and the emotions are gonna drive the behavior and your body and your mind are gonna respond. So if you are in a classroom and the teacher says something or, some, or does something that reminds your student or triggers your student into a memory or a thought that doesn't feel safe and they make that connection to that teacher, the neurochemistry for that teacher is going to be danger. And even if the danger doesn't truly exist, it's a perceived danger that they have in their mind, the neurochemistry will continue to behave as if it were real, okay? So that's super important for you to understand too. You can't tell a child or an older kiddo, you know, you gotta get over it or it doesn't matter, that, doesn't, that didn't happen or you're, it's, it's just all in your mind. It is in their mind, but perception is our reality, right? So if I perceive that Jessica Rice does not like me, if I think that, and the only reason I'm saying that is because I can see her. I only see four people on the screen. Thank God I don't see 300 because I'd probably be overwhelmed. But if I perceive, if I walk down the hallway in my school and Jessica walks past me and she rolls her eyes and I think that she's rolling her eyes at me, my perception is she rolled her eyes at me. And she may have been rolling her eyes at something the person who was right next to her said or something she was thinking about. But if I take that personally, I will then make an attachment to Jessica Rice does not like me and my body will respond and my behaviors will respond in the same way. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are gonna do their job, whether it's true or perceived to be true. So that's super important. Again, this is just a depiction of neuroplasticity. I thought it was a fun picture of the brain and that's why I put it on there. But I just want you to see, it just kind of, to me, it's just a great picture of how beautiful the brain is hardwired and that we can have with all of this beautiful, mindful, uh, social, emotional learning that we can in, you know, really wrap our brain around that we can take behaviors that once maybe didn't support optimal learning and we can foster through love and connection and compassion, these really beautiful neuro structures that will help kids develop trust and notice and attention and allowance. I'm gonna just talk about very briefly the competency of self-awareness. I think we kind of went over this, but it's really important for us all to be aware of how am I feeling and where am I feeling that? And then being able to do that work of taking a couple of slow deep breaths, taking a couple of moments just to pause. Laura said the power of pause and just being in that right place so that you're not bringing over any visceral or limbic things to your students. Just know that you can change their, their environment, you know, by rolling, you know, by anything that you might say or do. So if you're holding on to stress or anxiety, just be aware of that and kind of say, okay, self, I'm feeling a little, a little overwhelmed right now. What do I need? And then I was just wanting to tell you that humans who lack that self-awareness can be easily caught up in the emotion and behavior of other people. This happens to kids all the time. So children might be very fine and then all of a sudden, sudden somebody has a big emotion and emotes that in a big way and the student that maybe you're working with then takes, you know, takes that cue and behaves similarly. And so it would be really important for us just to be curious about that and to be, be, maybe help them to, you know, instead of, you know, just thinking about those, that, those, the language of, of intention of how would we talk to that instead of a corrective thing, like you don't have to act like that just because Johnny is, you know, cutting up doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're, it's time for you to do that too. You could be saying, you, you know, noticing and acknowledging Jonathan is feeling really angry right now. Um, I'm wondering if we can support him by doing a mindful breath. You know what I mean? So you kind of give your, your, your younger a job. And as far as olders, that's really tricky. You know, 
It's tough when children are in middle and high school and those behaviors have become very embedded and they identify with that. So, I, you know, if you've got a kiddo who's walking down the hallway and he's, you know, really doing a lot of that posturing or she's doing a lot of that posturing, you know, we're not going to be able to stop them and say, looks like you're feeling really upset right now. It's just letting that person come in and it's changing us. So that we're soft to them. We're not, you know, butt, butting up against them with anger or fear. Um, so as educational technicians, you have to first be aware of your own emotions and then invite yourself to become self-aware. And like Laura said, know your triggers. And Andrea, this is your language of intention. Do you want to go through that? Yeah, so I think the thing to remember here is that our mind thinks in pictures. So you need to give your brain signals that it understands. And so if you take a look at the left-hand side of the graphic, you'll see that I've listed a couple of situations here. Um, and, and so these are situations that, you know, could be positive situations, negative situations, um, really depends on the kid and who they are and what they enjoy and, and what they don't enjoy. And then if we go back to the idea that thoughts cause feelings, um, you know, we've got, we can break down our thoughts into whether we think they're coming from our protecting brain or from our thinking brain. Those that are coming from the protecting brain are going to be very vague and very hard to see in the brain, right? So when you say, or you hear a student say, this is stupid. Well, first of all, it's really difficult to see this. What's this? This could be something that they are seeing in their mind that happened hours ago. It might not be the writing that's in front of them at this time. And, and go ahead and try for just a second in your mind to picture stupid. How do you picture stupid, right? Your brain can't see it, right? And so that's how you kind of know when this real vague language that's nondescript but also can seem very descript um, happens. It's, it's really coming from that protecting brain. and so. Your thinking brain is going to make things much clearer, okay? So, for example, I'm going to name the thing, right? So instead of saying this, I'm actually going to use a direct noun, writing. What is writing? Writing is tricky, right? Again, tricky is going to be one of those words, though, that is, go ahead in your mind and picture tricky. What does, what does tricky look like? It's going to look differently for every kid. It's an incredibly difficult thing to um to 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 picture um and and so uh you have to when you're supplying language of intention or you're helping a student to get through um their language and and supplying them with language of intention you really want to try to think of things and use words that they can make that picture of in their mind because that's how they're going to connect to it and that's what what's going to help drive that emotion. Um, if we take a look at the soccer example, um, again, this could be a positive situation, right? The same thing works in a positive connotation. If your protecting brain might be like, that was awesome, right? Because it's, it's happy, it's like firing. But what was that and how do you picture awesome, right? That could be anything. Awesome, I, if, how, could, how would you draw a picture? of awesome. But if you take a look at the thinking brain, I could say, yeah, scoring a soccer goal is amazing. And in my mind, I can see the thing is the scoring. And then I can picture what that looks like. I can see the ball going in the net. And I don't know about you, or if you've ever caught a ball or kicked a ball or even gotten an A on a spelling test, you can see that in your head. And if your skin isn't tingling right now, thinking about something that is a, is a joy for you, then, then you've got to change your, change your picture in your mind. So when you're using language of attention, it's super important to use words that are easy to build pictures of because that's going to connect it and that's going to build the intention of that. I appreciate you breaking that down for us. One of the things that you might be able to see here are the words like tricky, 
and even though. And we use those words when we're working with youngers and olders. So if a, if a student says to you, you know, I just can't do this, can't equals won't try my best. It sends a signal to the brain that I am stupid. This isn't worth it. I've tried it before. And even if you say to them, oh, yeah, you can just try it again or try harder, they won't believe you because the brain is not here in the thinking. It's in the protecting brain. The protecting brain's in charge. So if a kid says this is stupid, you can say you're feeling like this is really tricky. I get it. You know, when I was a kid, writing was tricky for me too. So, you know, it just kind of changes. It, it's power, that's the power of that intentionality. And I can't do this. Instead of changing it to I can't, we use the words even though. Even though this is really tricky, I'm going to do my best. Or I'm still learning. You know, if a kid says I can't do this, oh, you're still learning. Why would you think you could? You know, that's okay. You're still learning. I didn't know how to do math like this. I had to learn it too. So just, um, you know, kind of, it's called language of intention, but it really aligns itself with the growth mindset. And just choice words for educational technicians to use with reactive students are those words, even though this is tricky. The other thing that I really wanted to convey to you is when we have a non-attachment to feeling, we don't, um, we change things. So if a kid says to you, I'm really just an angry, I'm just angry, I'm, I'm an angry person. We change that to you're feeling angry, or I feel angry too, so that that the emotion doesn't equal the person. The emotion is something the person feels, right? So I'm going to quickly just go through mindful practices to support self-awareness. And the first one is really breathing on purpose. Lots of teachers take breath breaks. You can too. If you're working with younger kiddos, you can just, you know, set, you can do and be the alpha breather. You could just start with doing big, slow, deep breaths. Um, sometimes that really is just enough to help that person that you're with just kind of feel that you're in control and you're breathing on purpose and they will, you know, they'll just feel that because we're energetically connected. Also setting a really mindful intention for yourself. May I be patient? And you can say that to your kids too. Hey, let's set an intention. May we just do our best or let's, you know, let's just hope for the best. Let's do, you know, just bringing in that hope. Nothing uh, builds resilience more than hope and gratitude. And so, you know, if you can do just a, grat a gratitude minute where, you know, you just have the, have the student draw or think of something they're really grateful for, that's really, really helpful in changing the kind of neurochemistry and just bringing, bringing things down. Remembering that when you're uh, working with students who are reactive, 47% um, of the time that, we're, that human beings are awake, whether we're reactive or responsive, we're going to be engaging in memory thoughts or plans. So just know that, you know, it's tricky to keep people when the mind is wandering. So helping kids anchor by just breathing three slow, deep breaths. And if a thought pops up, then you, they can just, you know, simply say, oh, I'm thinking, and then go back to breathing. So mindful breathing is a really important strategy. Oh, to kind of weave in a little bit of MTSS here into your SEL learning, um, I'm going to answer a pretty basic question of what is then what isn't when it comes to tiers one, two, and three. So what it is, is a layering of interventions that's based on a student response. Okay, so it's a layering of interventions that's based on a student response. What it isn't is louder and longer, right? And so um, if you are applying an intervention with a student and they're not responding in a favorable way, they're not responding in the way that you want them to be responding or the teacher is responding um, or anything like that, pulling them out into the hallway to do the same activity might work for some kids, but for the most part, you're just doing louder, longer because your emotions are going up the teacher's emotions are going up, the kids' emotions are going up, and your voices are bound to get louder, your, your blood pressure is about to get higher, um, your heart pounding is potentially getting louder. And so louder is, is, could be used in a multiple different ways. And then just doing it longer isn't always going to be the right thing to do. And so when you think of tiers one, two, and three, tier one is the thing that all students get. All students get it no matter what. It's the preventative tier. And anything that you're doing within that tier one is really and truly designed as a preventative measure. We should be preventing kids from falling behind the cracks, between the cracks. We should be preventing kids from, um, um, from you know, getting into these dysregulated situations as best as we can. We should be, it's really a system of prevention. 
But when that prevention is not enough or it's not working, that's when we have to start layering on these other layers of support and systems of support. And so tier two is actually tier one. And then I'm going to layer on top of it tier two, right? So a good way to think about this is, is a, a metaphor. You're taking a group of students to the beach. Now, normally I use a blanket metaphor, but I'm so sick of the cold that we're going straight to summer, okay? You're taking a group of kids to the beach and um, every kid is gonna get sunscreen, right? You even brought multiple bottles of sunscreen and every child is gonna get sunscreen. You're not even going to assume that they got it at home. You're just gonna be like, okay, come on up here to me, Joey. Or if you're at high school, be like, hey, Sam, come get your sunscreen. Yeah, I know, I don't care you got it at home. Come on over, come get your sunscreen, right? Every kid is gonna get sunscreen. That's your preventative measure. But you got a kid that went to the beach yesterday and that child did not get sunscreen that day. And you notice that they have a pretty gnarly sunburn on their shoulders already, right? Sunscreen's probably not gonna be enough in this situation. They need something else. So you could say, well, you know, kiddo, here's an extra t-shirt that I brought. I'd like you to put that t-shirt on over your shoulders just so that it doesn't get even more burned. Now, you're not going to take the sunscreen away to put the T-shirt on. You're going to layer the T-shirt onto the kid that already applied the sunscreen, right? And so your intervention at Tier 2 increases in intensity, right? So you've, you've increased the protection layer by putting a layer of fabric in between the sun and their skin. And they're probably going to wear it for the entire time. And we've narrowed the focus. That's the definition of intensity when it comes to, to MTSS. More time, narrowed focus. So when you get more time or a more narrowed focus on your intervention, that's where you start manipulating or navigating between tiers one and tiers two. So then let's say you've got a kiddo that was, you know, that has just, she's, she's just gotten her brand new contacts, brand new contacts. And the eye doctor has said, you know, she really shouldn't be in the sun. She really shouldn't be in the sun. Um, you know, her eyes are bound to be sensitive. They're bound to be, you know, she can't get sand in her eyes. She shouldn't get water in her eyes while her eyes are adjusting to these contacts. So you could say, wow, you know, um, this child needs a third layer of protection. Not only did they go to the beach yesterday and got sunburn all over themselves, but now I've got to protect their eyes too, right? And so you're not going to take their sunscreen away. Well, you don't need that just because you're wearing contacts. And you're not going to take their t-shirt away because, oh, well, you don't need that because t-shirt's not going to protect your eyes. You're, they're going to keep those layers and you're going to give them a pair of sunglasses, right? So, oh, oh, do you have any sunglasses? Did you have a friend that had sunglasses? Oh, I have some extra sunglasses here. And so you're going to additionally add on that layer. So now you're at the beach with a, with a group of kids and you've got some kids that are just fine with just sunscreen. You've got some kids that are wearing sunscreen and t-shirts. And then you've got a few kids that are wearing sunscreen, t-shirts, and then maybe an extra hat that you had to bring along or an extra pair of sunglasses. And all of these kids still got sunscreen. <laughs> and so you have to apply that layer based on the response to their specific needs. And they get more and more targeted as you go up those tiers. And then, you know, the next time you take that same group of kids to the beach, Maybe Sally doesn't need those sunglasses anymore because she's had her contacts for a year. So you're not going to just assume that Sally needs sunglasses every time she goes to the beach. She doesn't need them next time. And maybe she doesn't have a sunburn either and just sunscreen will do for her, right? And so knowing what our kids' needs are at that point in time is super important and even comes into play with this emotional learning as well. Because what you might apply for helping them work through their emotions and work through their social and emotional learning you can apply and take away as they learn to adapt and grow and self-regulate. Those are great examples. And, um, you know, just being able to think in those metaphors um, is really important. And that, you know, that teacher is going to su supply that first tier and you can support that first tier. And then as we look at the individual needs of our students, but never forget that you know them and you know where their behavior, what, what the behavior is telling you if, you if you sit with it with curiosity. So Laura, I'm just curious, is there anything else you maybe want to add to this? You know, as you know, your the, the tiers of support that you might I love the what it's not is louder and longer and stronger and more urgent. Maybe you could just talk about your self-awareness just in, you know, briefly how you prepare yourself to become self-aware before you. Um... Two things that we talked about yesterday. I think if, you're, if we're talking about ourselves in a situation, ed techs in a situation, we really do need to practice 
a certain degree of mindfulness so that we are aware of our own triggers and that we are aware of um, our responses to children. Um, and then yesterday we talked about the example of a student in a classroom that's having a difficult time on the tier one level. And what we're, oh, we were talking about even um, doing a, breathe, a classroom breathing exercise. And one of the children in the classroom is just refusing to do it and starting to escalate or whatever. So to be able to take that student either to the back of the room or even to crouch down behind him, him or her and just offer to breathe with, you know, would you, would you like to breathe with me? That, Tier three would be to, if a child just is refusing to do things and is totally escalated, to maybe bring them out of the classroom. And I know in situations where children are very, very dysregulated, to invite, I've, I've invite them. Would you like me to help you calm your body? Do, you know, is there anything that I can do right now to help you calm your body? If they don't come up with anything because they are that dysregulated, Oftentimes I'll say, would you like to breathe with me? I know that breathing helps me calm myself. And I'll off, you know, can we hold hands? And then we'll breathe in together, out together, in together, out together. And even a, a more advanced tier three is to do all of the education about brain. To, you know, like when your body is feeling like this, it's because this is what's happening in your brain. And there are ways that our brains are and our bodies are trying to show us that we're approaching that point of not no return, but becoming terribly dysregulated. And that doesn't feel good, does it? So um, Andrea's raising her hand. Did you have something you wanted to? I just want to build on what you're saying, um, because I think you're absolutely right. And then I also wanted to just note here that one of the ways that we're, we normally see as educators is we normally see MTSS or um, sometimes known as RTI, we usually see it as a triangle that's green, red, and yellow, or green, yellow, and red, right? And, and I wanted to just make note here, again, to that visual piece, um, because if you look at how the colors change, you're going to see more and more of this as we get into more multi-tiered systems rather than RTI, because you'll notice that the colors only change because you added colors to it, right? So blue, and then I added the red to make purple, and then I added pink to make a magenta, right? And so um, it was a subtle thing, but it, it really gets more to that layering of interventions to change the color of something versus you are now in tier three, you are in the red zone. And right. not only are you not breathing right now, I'm taking you out of the classroom and you're gonna go do something somewhere else, right? That, that's not where we want it. We want them to still be breathing in the classroom if we can possibly help it. So that's all I wanted to say. Andrea, yeah. I think that is so incredibly important because coming from that uh, mindful place and, you know, my job as a social emotional learning specialist is to help you understand, for help all educators across the state and what our commissioner is looking for us to do is really take a step towards compassion, care, love, and connection. You know, it's not a punitive thing. Kids who learn tricky, kids who have, you know, have a pattern of learning tricky, they will have, be the toughest children to reach, but they'll be the most engaging children to, to, to educate if we can connect with them. I'm just wondering if Jessica wants to hop on here. I know that when you get kids coming in, you, they're in ISS, they're in in-school suspension. And let me see if I can unmute you. I just would love to, um, are you able to do that? Yeah, there you are. Yeah. Any thoughts on this? Because you are that tier three. Once they come to you, they're in, they're in, they've been in hot water. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been amazing, um, especially when I'm thinking about all the stuff we're learning today combined with the trauma training. There's a lot of overlap, um, obviously. Um, and uh, it's funny because when I get those kids, I would honestly 90 to 95% of the kids I get by the end of the day are asking if they can come back the next day to, to learn because it's such a, we, I create an atmosphere where we have um, relaxing music playing. I turn the lights down. Um, they don't have their cell phone, so there's no distraction. So you're taking, you're creating an environment where they're, they're, um, the, the amygdala is not going off, you know, constantly. Um, and I realize now as I've done these trainings with you and as I've done those other trainings that it's the reason they want to come back is because 
they're they're able to get into a, a they're able to focus there, there's not those distractions going on all the time so um i loved i loved andrea's um how she's explaining the layers and how we're adding to the interventions too um but I don't know. Yeah. So one of the things you told me in a previous training is that, you know, you stand at the door and you welcome, um, welcome your, your kiddos. And you tell them, thanks for showing up for ISS. Thanks for coming today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's something about, I heard Laura say too, it's I'm inviting them to do this. So there's something very different in I'm telling you to do this and you're getting into a power struggle with a child or I'm inviting you to do this. Um, somebody in the chat said, yes, but what do you do about, you know, this isn't magic. If, if there is a child who has a significant and extreme emotional emotional disorder or emotional disability and that's there and they're in a self-contained environment and they have some true mental and behavioral health issues this is not a one one thing fits all you know there are many 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 other supports that we have to take into consideration with this and you know this is we're talking about you know an educational technician who is working with a student or a group of students choosing to see the behaviors that maybe are minimally or moderately disruptive and and instead of approaching that behavior from a place of urgency or you have to just hi everybody we understand that the webinar ended abruptly we will be picking up where we left off at the beginning of the next webinar but until then we invite you to participate in your own self-reflection perhaps think of a student that you had in mind today when you were learning about TFAR, the amygdala, the brain response, upstairs brain, downstairs brain, tiers one, two, and three, big emotions, anything that you can think of. And on a piece of paper, just reflect for a little while on your previous interactions with that student and how you may change your interactions with that student moving forward. See you soon.